grace and grace is in the covenant and we're going to have grace in the covenant part two uh, today. We're going to continue on. Um, we're going to read Hebrews 8 and verse 10 again. So if you have your Bibles, follow along. This is very important to me and it grows uh, every day in me. And I've seen some things in this, how it could help you, uh, how it could change you from the inside out. The Word of God just, it's effortless change. It just changes us. And to know who we are, and uh, to know who we are, we got to know who He is. Amen. we got to know what He has done for us so we can uh, take our rightful place. So in Hebrews 8, in verse 10, he says, For this is the covenant of all make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. When? No, no more. more. No more. No more. And that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes away, <coughs> waxes old, is ready to vanish away. It's ready to vanish away if we'll let it. Mm -hmm. If we're letting, if we could, if we could just understand, I believe that that He says your sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. How's that going to benefit me? Well, He said you come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain help in times of need. And so, a lot of people are not coming uh, to the Lord because they think their sins are being held against them, mm -hmm. and they feel shame, and so they don't want to come to the Lord. They don't want to uh, come and ask for healing, for forgiveness, for whatever he has because they feel ashamed. Because people have said, and I have said, well, I've done too much. I've went too far. I've done this. And and Bible says, he says, I made a covenant that their sins and iniquities I would remember no more. And so you, whoever will, let him come. But the message has to get out there. Mm -hmm. That whoever will, let him come. That the price has already been paid. Like Tim said, it is finished. I heard a teaching on that very thing. And it was awesome that he brought that up. Because in the Greek, uh, or no, not the Greek, but they spoke Aramaic a lot. And, the, and when he said it is finished, in the Aramaic, he said, my bride. And I thought, that is awesome. You know, that now he's 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 finished this, he's done this for his bride. So the bride may come and so we can enter into the presence of God and we can have the presence and I'm not waiting on heaven for the presence of God. I enjoy the presence of God uh, quite often. You know, I, I, he's, he's always on my mind. No matter what I'm doing, where I'm at, he, he's always there and there's uh, uh, Always opportunities and you, you 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 see him and you see a need for him in people's lives. You see a need for him in people's lives. I met a lady this week. Her uh, niece is six years old. She's in St. Jude in Memphis and uh, she had brain surgery in Nashville and they wouldn't do no more for her. They said, that's all we're doing. St. Jude said, bring her. Bring her here. And uh, the lady was telling me and I said, you know, I'm going to I, and she said, her name is Miranda. I said, what's her name? She said, it's Miranda. She's six years old. And I said, I'm going to believe that Miranda is healed. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, doctors do whatever they can and uh, to keep you alive and everything. But God has provided healing. Mm -hmm. I don't say God, you know, he's going to, he's already provided for it. And, and uh, I'm just praying for her parents and her uh, aunts and everybody to speak life over that little girl. Yeah. Speak healing over that little girl. And so uh, we want to go on into this grace is in the covenant. First uh, Samuel in 18 uh, and verse 1. And it came to pass 
when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his uh, girdle or the waistband. Now, if you were here last week, we talked about the blood covenant, didn't we? We talked about the covenant of blood. And this is what David and Jonathan did. It wasn't just he gave him a coat, he gave him a sword. They made a blood covenant that day. They went through the whole ritual we described last week. They took off their coat, they took off their weapons, and they uh, exchanged uh, these things. And they went through the whole thing of the blood covenant. They cut their wrists and they uh, done all of this. They made a covenant that day. 1 Samuel 20 and 13, the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do the evil, then I will show it thee and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace and the Lord be with thee as he hath been with my father. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also that thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan, Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying that the Lord even required at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own uh, soul. In verse 42, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. In those times, when a king took over another king's kingdom, he made, it was... Customary, I guess. It was the world system to destroy everybody of that house in that lineage so that they could never lay claim to that kingdom again. And so this is why Jonathan's not just saying that, that I want a covenant that I die not, that when you take over kingdom that I don't die, that you don't kill me or your, your, uh, your kingdom and all the people that you have under you kill me. But I want this to continue forever. I, I want this between my house and your house. And so they're going, this covenant goes against every earthly thing, every government thing, every thing that that man has set up the way you do it because it could cause problems. You know, they thought, well, if we leave a son or a grandson or a great grandson alive, they could come one day and say, no, let's, let's, let's go back to the way it was and when my grandfather ruled and gather up a, a, an army and go against them. And so they would wipe everybody out, wipe every one of them out. And so Jonathan is making a covenant because Jonathan, the son of Saul, who is the king, and it would come to Jonathan to be the next king. Jonathan is saying, I see the anointing on you to be the next king, not me. So when you become king, I want to I wanna make a covenant with you. That, that my family would not die. Second Samuel 3 and 1 says, Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Now, Saul at this point is done dead. Jonathan and David, or Jonathan and Saul have been killed in battle at this point. First Samuel, at the end of the book, it tells about the death of Saul and the death of Jonathan in a battle. And you say, well, where's this war coming from? It's coming from Saul's descendants, his other uh, son and, and other people that were in that kingdom at that time. Because not just, you know, it's like an elected official. When, when uh, we elect another president or senator, they not only lose their job, but everybody that worked for it has to find another job. Because they were supporting that one. And a new one comes in, brings in their entourage, we'll say. And so this is the way. And so they're fighting to keep their position 
Because Saul is now dead, and so it goes to somebody else. So one of others, uh, one of the other sons of Saul is trying to take over. But God has told David he will be the king. And so there's war between the house of David and the house of Saul. 2 Samuel 4 and 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. Came to pass that she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Uh, now here's, you know me, I love definitions of, of words and stuff because they have such great meaning. And, and I looked and I, and, and I never thought about this. The Holy Spirit said, look, look this up and, and look and see what this means. Uh, and so Jonathan has a son, he's five years old and Jonathan and Saul are both dead. And so Mephibosheth would have been in line to take the kingdom, right? He would have been in line to have took him. And even though he's five years old, that doesn't matter. You know, you look in the book of 1 Kings, 2 Kings, there was a lot of young people got to be king because their parents died. And so he, and so the nurse knew, the nurse says, you know, David's people are going to kill him. So they took him up and they ran. And as she ran, she dropped him and it, it messed him up. And so he's lame on both of his feet. But I looked at this and Jonathan, Jonathan means Jehovah given. Mephibosheth's dad's name, Jonathan, was Jehovah given. And Jonathan made a covenant with David. Because he said, you're going to be the king. You're going to be the ruler. You're going to take over this. So I want to make a covenant with you. And Jehovah, Jonathan's name means Jehovah given. And, and it automatically talked, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, Jonathan is Jehovah given. Uh, Saul's name, or no, wait a minute, let's go to this. Mephibosheth name means dispeller of shame. Dispeller of shame is who Mephibosheth is. Now, in their time, being lame like he was, it automatically would have made him, if it hadn't been for his lineage and who he was, if he had just been somebody, uh, he would have been a beggar because he couldn't get up and work, he couldn't do it. So he would have become a beggar. And that is, we look at that as what? Shame. He's, he's crippled. And so we would look up on that. He's crippled and, and he has to beg and we, we feel sorry for him. And there's a lot of shame goes with that, you know. And so he is a dispeller. His name means dispeller of shame. That, that's kind of odd, isn't it? But his dad's was Jehovah given. Saul's name means asked. Means asked. Saul's name is asked. And David's name means loving or friend. And I thought, man, that is so awesome that the one Jonathan God gave produced a son that would dispel shame. <laughs> Anybody with me? Anybody preaching with me this morning? That, that Saul, you know, was asked and produced a son that was God-given and he produced a son that dispelled shame. And so there's no more shame. Keith Moore taught me this a long time ago. We always used to say this, with shame on you. How come you didn't come to church? Shame on you. How come you didn't do this? Shame on you. Keith Moore said, don't do that. You're working for the devil. <laughs> and he got it right as quiet as it did in his church. He said, don't do that. Don't put shame on people because that's what the devil does. Because shame makes you draw back. Shame makes you not come to him or, 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 or do what you know God wants you to do. God has something for you to do. And you need to know that he has dispelled the shame off of you. Well, I'm not perfect. Neither was Mephibosheth. He's lame on both of his feet, yet he is named dispeller of shame. Now, let's get deep. Uh, 2 Samuel 9. 
Now this is, he's five years old when, when his dad dies. He's five, my figure says, five years old, right? Second Samuel and nine, many years have passed. I don't know really how many. I think I read somewhere like 25 or so years had passed. It's a long time. Well, the guy, if you read on down, I, I have because I studied for this, so I know. So I read on down, this guy is married, he's got a kid. He's got a kid. So many years have passed, okay? And David says, is there any, yet any that is left of the house of Saul? You see, because they've been having war. And he said, is anybody left of the house of Saul? That we may kill? No. Is there any left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness? Why? Because David is loving. Mm -hmm. And David is a friend. But most of all, David has a covenant with the one God gave. He's got a covenant with him. And he said, with his seed and his seed and his seed forever. I've got a covenant. And I, I want to fulfill that covenant. Is there any left of that house? Because if David had said, is there any left that we may kill? They might not have said anything. But he said, is there any left that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So he's talking about the covenant. And there was at the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? He said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I might show the kindness of God unto? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. Now notice what they bring up first thing. Shame. Mm -hmm. Ziba. He's lame. Why do you want him? He's lame. There's nothing he can do for you. And get this, he's no threat to you. He's no threat to you. You don't have to kill him. He's no threat to you. And, and so he's lame on both of his feet. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of uh, Machar, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. And the word Lodabar means pastureless. There are no pastures there. There's nothing, there's nothing there for cattle to graze, sheep to graze, anything to graze. So what's going on? Well, I've done some studying in Lodabar was, was kind of the holdup place for all of Saul's people. They had kind of claimed this place and went down there away from David in their house and they're kind of, and see, Mephibosheth has grown up you know, he's of the house of Saul, and they're at war continually with the house of David. And so they're telling him, you know, David must die. If David dies, then you can be the king. And so all of this is put into Mephibosheth's head this whole time because it's kind of a military outpost, I read. It's kind of a military outpost for the people of Saul. Because, see, they want back in, they want to be back in charge. And, and so all of this is going up. Well, he says, well, um, he says, go get him. Bring him here. It says, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said unto Mephibosheth, and he answered, behold, thy servant. David said unto him, fear not. Why would he say that if he wasn't afraid? He knows Mephibosheth was afraid. Mephibosheth was probably trembling because here comes the king's men on the king's horses and surround your house and says the king wants you. Well, I know it happened sooner or later. I know he probably finds us. And they take him and he's probably thinking, well, this is it. I'll never see my family no more. This is, this is it. It's over because this is how the system works. This is how the world works. This is just how it goes. Have you ever heard the term? It's not personal. It sure feels personal. It's not personal. It's just something we have to do so that we can so that we can rest easy and we know that nobody will try to take over. But David is a lover. He's a friend. He is kindness. He says, "No, I want to show you this. I want to give you this." And he said, uh, "I will surely show thee kindness. That word kindness is favor and mercy." 
And so he says, I'm gracing you because of the grace covenant that I had with your father. Uh, he says, I will surely show kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. All the land of the former king. Now, how much do you think that was? <laughs> how much does our government own? 20 acres? 30? 100? They own a bunch. And so he says, I will restore to you all the land of your father Saul. All of it. Every bit of it is yours now. Man, David, what are you doing? Can you imagine the king's advisors? What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? You know what you're going to you're, do. You're empowering him. He says, no, I'm dispelling shame. I'm dispelling shame. Uh... And he says, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant? Thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I gave, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and thou shalt bring in the fruits that my master's son may have food to eat but Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. My, thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table and I jotted this down. What if he does something wrong? When a king made a decree, it could not be taken back. And so he's saying he will eat. What if he rebels one day against you, David? What if he, what if he does something wrong? What if he don't do something you like? David said he shall eat bread at my table continually. He will have fellowship with me continually. He will be in my presence every time we sit down for a meal. At my table is where I eat and that's where he shall be. Now let's go on. Uh, now Ziba had 15 sons, 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, listen, he just keeps saying this. He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Now he's up to it, hasn't he? He will eat bread at my table continually. Now he says, wait a minute, he's going to eat? At my table continually as one of my sons. That's what he's going to do. Because of this covenant. As one of the king's son. And you know I thought what, what Jesus has done for us in the covenant. And we go to God and we can be in his presence. As one of his sons. I didn't like that. You sure you said that right? You sure that's right? At, no, wait a minute. As a servant. Is that better? Does that make you feel better? You can you, you come into it as, as a servant. No, he said he's going to eat bread at my table continually as one of my sons. And... Uh, and I thought about that as, as they ate there. Now, Mephibosheth is lame. Mephibosheth says, I'm a dead dog. I'm not worthy of all of this. Why are you looking at me like this? Why are you showing me all this favor? Why is this happening to me? Why am I so blessed? And I believe David put out his hand and he says, because of the covenant that I have with Jonathan. The one God has given. I've got a covenant. Every time I thought of this. I saw it in my mind. Every time they were eating at the table. You know sometimes he's sitting there with all the king's son. And they're all arrayed in the, in the king's garments. And how the king's son's dressed. And, and he looks down and he's in the same dress. He's in the same garments and he looks down at himself and he's thinking, I don't deserve to be here. I, I don't deserve to be here, but I am. 
And so every time David would reach for the mashed potatoes, he could see the scar on David's wrist. And he could remember the one that was given by Jehovah, his daddy. He said, because of the covenant, my, the one God gave, I'm sitting at the king's table. I'm wearing the king's clothes. I'm eating the king's food. And I'm, I'm here in his presence. And, and, you know, people had to get a, uh, an appointment with the king. And it wasn't easy. You didn't just walk up there and see the king. I mean, everybody's wanting to see David. Everybody's wanting a uh, presence with the king. But every time they sit down to a meal, he's there. He's there. And he has favor with the king. Because all he has to do is look what he's eating, look what he's wearing, look where he's seated at. And he said, I've got the favor. I've got grace on me. And so he could just ask David, hey, David, could, 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 it, could I do this? Could you do this for me? And he said, why, why do you even ask? Why, why do you even ask? The covenant. It's there. Remember the exchanging? We talked about last week. It's the exchange. You don't have to beg him. You, you don't have to go and say, oh God, please do this. Please do this. No. You, you've got the covenant. You know, you, you've got to proclaim that. Timmy was talking about his shoulder this week. I couldn't lift my arm up over this height. Well, without excruciating pain. And I thought, well, where did this come from? You know? Because when you're as young as me, you sh <laughs> That wasn't meant to be humor. That's not humor part. That's truth. I speak truth. When you're as young as me, you shouldn't have those problems. And so I lift it right there, and it would hurt. And so I would lift it, and I'd say, in the name of Jesus, because of the covenant, and I would hold it there, and it hurt him. And I'd, I'd hold it there until it went away. And I'd, I'd speak to it, and I'd say, because of the covenant, pain be gone. And it quit hurting, and I'd go a little higher, and it hurt again. And I'd say, because of the covenant, because of the covenant I have, or Jesus has, and I, I've accepted the terms of the covenant, and I'd raise it on up until I got it all the way up to where I could do this. And I didn't go, oh, that hurts. Or I could do that. And I, but I had to speak to it. I had to get it up over where it hurt. And I just, in the name of Jesus, I have a covenant. And the covenant covers that. Mm -hmm. And the enemy says, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. It covers that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and so we remember the covenant. And so Mephibosheth, the dispeller of shame. <laughs> And if anybody ever dispelled shame, he sure did, didn't he? Coming from where he was at, a pastureless land, coming, and now he possesses everything of a king. Listen to this. He's eating at the king's table, possessing everything that a king had. Can I say this? That's you and me. If we've entered, if we, well, if we understand the covenant that the one that God gave made for us. That's us. If we just understand and we receive that and say, that, that's it. I started to say, if we enter into a covenant, but it's him that entered the covenant. I told you last week, I said, God made a covenant with his son so we wouldn't mess it up. And so he came, made the covenant, and he died because man had broken the covenant, and he died in our place, but then he rose again. And he's the one that God gave. He's our Jonathan. And because of that, I'm at the king's table, eating the king's food, wearing the king's clothes. Not because of anything I've done. I'm lame on my feet. But he made a covenant. But what? And so many people today are going, but I messed up. I got to do better this week. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm messed up. I got to do better this week. 
Because God won't let me eat at his table this week because I've messed up. No, he said, you shall eat it continually at my table. And because I eat at that table and I eat that food, I've got the strength. See, God not only said, I will remember your iniquities no more, and my laws, I will put them in your mind and in your heart. Not on tablets of stone. He put them on stone because stone is dead. There's no life to it. He said, I'll put them in something living. And he gives us the power. Tim, talking about the power. He gives us the power to do it. Now, in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing, but we should live out of our flesh. Like Tim said, used to. I've done everything my flesh wanted to do. But now, it wants to do a lot of things. I'm saying, no, no, no. I want to get upset and angry at Angie sometimes. And I say, no, no, no. Right? Down, boy, no. Care what she does, no. Right? And she does the same for me. I see her face turn red sometimes and it wants to explode. And she'll just go off and I'll think, don't say anything else. Just leave it, leave it alone. Let that lie. And then she'll come back like nothing's ever happened. I think, all right. We've grown. We're growing. We're getting there. Uh I thought, I thought of this. I love it when the Holy Spirit corrects me. When I think of something, I go, yeah. And then the Holy Spirit says, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, take it a little deeper. Look at this deeper. Because I thought, when Mephibosheth looked at the scars on David's hands, he understood that there's a covenant that Jonathan has made. There's a covenant that he had made. And because of that covenant, I'm here. And so every time he looked at that, remember we talked about last week, every time you looked at that, you could remember I'm in covenant. And when other people saw it, they saw you were in covenant with somebody else. So it's just not you. They're not picking on you. You know, it's easy to pick on somebody that's little or somebody that's weak. But when you find out their big brother, <laughs> you know, He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. And he has the host of the armies of heaven at his disposal. You're like, back up. Back up. <laughs> you don't want to unleash that. And, and so uh, I, I thought every time my people chef looked at that, the dispeller of shame looked at the scars, he remembered there's a covenant. And I thought of this. I thought every time Jesus, God looks at Jesus, he remembers the covenant. And the Holy Ghost says, when does he ever look away? And I thought, man, what? He said, he always, he's at his right hand. He's there making intercession for us. He's there. He, he is our covenant. And, and he's always with him. He never looks away and then has to look. He, he doesn't go, wait a minute, I'm going to take out those twin towers. I'm going to send a, a tsunami. I'm going to send an earthquake. I'm going to uh, send diseases. I'm going to send all that. I'm going to destroy. Wait a minute. And he looks up and goes, oh, wait. Oh, I started to do some stuff. I better pull back and not destroy them all. Just destroy a few because now I remember. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I seen yours. No, he always. We're always in there. Because Jesus is there, right there. And he says, no, I, he never forgets his covenant. He doesn't, he doesn't have to be, Jesus doesn't say, hey, Father, no, 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 I can't do that. You can't kill, you can't, no, you've killed enough. Stop it. Remember, remember the covenant. Remember the covenant. No. He doesn't do that. He always is there. He's always mindful because he's always gracious <laughs> of who we are. Last verse, it says, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, the city of the king, city of peace. Notice he changed places. He went from a pastureless land to the, the, the place of peace. 
for he did eat continually at the king's table. And notice this, and was lame on both his feet. He still messed up and his physical part. But he's in a different place. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I got to go. I'm, I'm already behind. <laughs> Matthew in 27, verse 28. This is Jesus. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a corn of, crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They put on him a scarlet robe. The word robe is military cloak. Scarlet was red. It was for sin. Isaiah 119, come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Notice he says, your sins are red as scarlet. Red as crimson. But he said, they shall be as wool. And so what's going on at the crucifixion is they're taking off the garment of Jesus. And they're putting on this garment of sin. It's red, like crimson. It's, it's representative of sin. And they put it on. And I thought it's something because the robe said military cloak. And I thought it was red and it was a military cloak because he's doing battle. He's overcoming sin. He's taking care of sin. He's becoming sin for us. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 53, surely he hath borne our, born means to lift or to accept. Surely he has accepted our griefs. That word is disease and sickness. He's accepted that and carried our sorrows, which is pain and affliction. Yet we did a stream and smit, stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, our sin, and our rebellion. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of of his all. He became sin, who you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness. You see what's taking place? The covenant is being unfolded mm -hmm. there at the cross. The covenant is being made at the cross. They're stripping him, taking what he, and remember, what did they do with his garment? What did they do with what he had on? They, they, they cast lots for the one part so they wouldn't part it. Remember? So it wouldn't be a part of it. They said they cast lots. So because he had a, a a a gown that was woven and it was one piece. And it was one piece, and they stripped him of that, and they wanted it. They said, This is valuable. Them soldiers understood something. Maybe not like we would think they would, but they said, Let's don't carry it apart. Let's cast lots for it and let's have this because it's valuable. What Jesus had was valuable. And what he gave to us was himself. He said, I'm exchanging places. So I'm taking this covenant. Uh, John 20, he said, when he had so said, he showed unto him his hands and his side. Then were disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They saw the, the scars in his wrist. They saw the scars. And so they knew this is him. This is the one. And so you can see. And no, I, I never thought about this. I heard somebody talking about this the other day. And I never really thought about it. But I thought, man, I never really considered that. Jesus didn't just come down here and, and then go back and go back to who he was before he came. He took on flesh for eternity. And he still has the scars. See, when he ascended, it was still him. They had touched him. He had ate with them. And 
You know, Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and the uh, wound in his side, I'll not believe. And he saw them and he said, here, put your hand in there. And he said, no, 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 I understand. And when he ascended, he ascended. And the angel said, what? This same Jesus who you see ascend shall come in like manner. And so he always has that. And I thought, man, to, to be who you were before you came. And now to, to take on this form of humanity, not just for 33 years, but to take it on and identify with us for, for eternity. He said, I shall. <laughs> no. Come on. Let's, let's wrap this up. Ephesians 4 and 17 he says this, I say therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. The word Gentile means people of no covenant. Paul said, now you've entered into a covenant. Don't walk like you did before. Mm -hmm. You have a covenant. Walk as covenant people. Walk as somebody who has a covenant. There's not a problem with God or Jesus remembering the covenant and fulfilling all of it. The problem is people, we don't understand what we have got in this covenant. And that's what people, like Tim said a while ago, what he did is enough. Who he is is enough. And when you, when you finally attain, most people want to come to him and have him to put something, his garment over them, but they never want to take off their garment. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to take off your garment and become everything that he is. Amen. He said, walk in the vanity of their mind, having to understand and darken, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over into the civilness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. But you not so learn Christ, if so that be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the sinful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So who has to do this? You do. You do. Let's go here for just a minute. Mephibosheth. As one of the king's sons. He's sitting there. Around the table. With all these others. Not only is he in fellowship. With David. He's in fellowship with all the others. They're all there. Because of David. All there. Because of David. Now, Mephibosheth is there because of Jonathan and David. Right? They're all there. And Mephibosheth, if you read David's, some of David's sons, they, they went off. They rebelled. They done all these things. Mephibosheth never did. He understood I believe he got a hold of the covenant. Here's what. He loved that shame being gone. He loved eating at the king's table. He loved being with the king's son. He loved that fellowship. He loved all of that. Ephesians 4, the last verse says, And be ye kind one to another, forgiving one another, for as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Brought us all into that. Fellowship. We shouldn't look for the things that divide us. We ought to look for the things that unite us. Mm -hmm. We ought to look for that and build on that. Now, we're not going to agree on everything. But if we can agree on something, then we can grow and build. And you can glean from me and I can glean from you. Because there's some things that you know and you've been through and God has revealed to you that he hasn't me yet, but he's wanting to reveal it to me through you. Mm -hmm. 
And so he wants me to know it. And see, what, what all we could have if, if the king's sons would just come together. If we could just be one as he and the father are one. If we could just come into that, the power of agreement. Because that's in the covenant. And this covenant is by grace. And we're all here by grace. We're healed, we're born again, we're delivered, we're prospering, we're walking in heaven because of grace. He didn't, David didn't need Mephibosheth. He didn't need him to conquer the kingdom. He didn't need him for all of that. He didn't have to have him. But after all them years and all them taking over territory and winning all them battles, he is always mindful of that scar. And he's saying, and then he gets to a point, he says, is there any left of the house of Saul that I can show kind? Is there anybody of the covenant that I can bring in here and show them the grace? Is there anybody out there that wants it? See, that's what we're called to do. Who know about the covenant, we're called to go and say, hey, come, come out of loaded bar." Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm doing right now. Doesn't matter. Just come and meet with the king. He wants you. He has sent me to tell you to come. So you can come. Everybody stand. I would have said, do you want to enter into a covenant with him and then after preaching this you'd say no because then you're going to slit my wrist and do all that stuff that would have been true if you were really wanted to enter into that covenant with him but Jesus through humanity entered into a covenant with the father so he bears the marks in his body so what's your part? believe believe this and then put off How many be honest in here? But I'm still, how many still putting off the old man? I'm still putting off the old man. I'm putting him off. Why? Because he don't fit in this new life. So I put him off. I just push him back. I said, no, no. And you say, I don't know about that denying self. I, I don't know about that. Well, I do. Tim does. He testified to it. It's a whole lot better to do what the Spirit says. It's just better to live that life and that more abundantly in Him. It's just better not to have the shame anymore. You know? I, I don't... We are dispellers of shame. How can you how can you live in this world all week and then come in here and raise your hands and praise this holy God? It's because I know how much I need him. It's because I know what he's done for me. Because he knows I'm still lame on my feet, but he knows I'm eating at his table continually. And he looks at me as one of his sons. And if I look at myself that way, then it changes the way I am. Mephibosheth didn't put on his old servant clothes and his old treasure clothes. He put on the kings. And he went to supper. And he went to breakfast. And he went to lunch. And he ate. And he was in the presence. Just to be in the presence. See, that's what we're missing in the houses of God anymore. Is that corporate presence. I'm not saying we don't have it individually, but we don't. Well, I praise Him when I'm in my car in my own way, and I, you know, I do that. But we ought to come in here together and know that, you know, we lay hands on the sick and we see them recover. As Tim said, we, we, we preach the good news to the poor uh, because... You know, we know that's what's going to bring them out. We set captives free. We open blinded eyes by the word that He has given us, by this covenant He has given us. 
But he started it out. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And, and so he said, I, I'm, I'm with the Father and the Father is with me. And just to know that, just to know that, man, it just releases me to live for him. Knowing he's empowered us to live for him. Mm -hmm. And I rest in that. I rest in it, and I want that for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not just you. I want it for you here that gathered with us every week, but I want it for everybody I come in contact with. Mm -hmm. You know? I want that for everybody. I, I want to see them come out of that mess that they're in. I want to see them come out of it because I was in that mess. Mm -hmm. I was there once. I know what it's like to live in all of that shame and all of that stuff and try to do better and then fall again. Try to do better and fall again. And finally you just give up because you think God requires me to do it on my own. God says, no. I don't require you to do it on my covenant with Him. And I sent you the Holy Ghost. He's the helper. He's the comforter. He's the teacher. He's the guide. He's the one called alongside to help. He's the one that's going to help you in this life. Everybody. Everybody. Or to have that. Every son. Or to have that. Every son ought to be clothed mm -hmm. with that. Every one. I'm going to go old school on you for just a second here, okay? You'll forgive me of my religious rhetoric here for just a second. Everybody bow your head and everybody close your eyes. Forgive me of this, but this is just what the Holy Ghost says. And so, is, is there any, any need, anything, that you have need of this morning. Anything. I'll agree with you. We'll lay hands on you. We'll anoint you. Uh, whatever you want. In any way. If you need anything. Because God just. I feel like God just wanted to, to clothe somebody. I feel like God just wanted to take shame away from somebody. He just, he just wanted them to understand. Quit looking at your feet. And look at you, garment. Look at where you're sitting today. Look at what look at the look at the covenant. Look at it today. Man, it'll change your it'll change everything in your life. I'm here to testify to that. It'll change everything in your life for the good. And I just sometimes I get so just who I just get so full. I even look at Angie and say, Man, I love you. I just get so full and I say, man, we're blessed. We're just blessed. That's the way I do God sometimes. I just drive down the road and I say, God, I love you. I just love you, Jesus. I just love you, Holy Ghost. Man, you've been so good to me. Man, you've just done so much. I just, I just overflow. I just get full. And then you come across somebody that's hurting and, and you just let that flow out of you. And it touches them. And it, and it, it can flow into their life. And they can have that. Hallelujah. 